very good afternoon to the distinguished faculty and my dear friends. I am going to speak on my study done on uh, serum bone specific alkaline phosphatase turnover in healing of tibial diaphyseal fractures done at the Department of Orthopedics in UCMS and GTB Hospital, New Delhi. We all know that a delayed union or a non-union fracture leads to immense morbidity to the patient. Clinical radiological methods have been used historically since uh, time immemorial to detect such, uh, to monitor the fracture healing, but these methods used alone are not uh, sufficient to detect a fracture going into a delayed union at an early stage. So new molecular uh, methods which like bone turnover markers can help in enhancing our uh, ability to detect the fra such fractures. These bone turnover markers uh, can be measured quantitatively uh, and they have been divided into three types according to their function, the bone formation markers, the resorption markers and the osteoclast regulatory proteins. Uh, this study done uh, in 2006 by Veach et, Veach et al. In, published in Osteoporosis International shows the changes in the bone turnover markers and uh, we can see that the maximum rise of bone specific alkaline phosphatase occurs at, at uh, around 8 to 12 weeks in fracture healing. So in our study we have cho chosen the bone formation marker, bone specific alkaline phosphatase which shows significant rise at an early stage of fracture healing when the fracture site becomes sticky. The aim of the study is to monitor the uh, marker level with clinical radiological healing in a tibial diaphyseal fracture. Uh, it is a prospective case series uh, with 25 patients uh, of closed tibial diaphyseal fractures and uh, the management was done with closed reduction and a above knee plastic cast which was later converted into a patellar tendon bearing cast. The inclusion criteria were healthy uh, adult male, uh, adult patients of 18 to 45 years and with isolated fractures. All uh, the polytrauma cases, head injuries were excluded and uh, any factor which affected the bone turnover and affected bone healing were excluded such as metabolic bone disease, inflammatory diseases, malignancy, renal or hepatic diseases or drug abuse like steroids, bisphosphonates, etc. Clinical radiological evaluation was done uh, till fracture unit at every four weeks and the union in the radiological union was defined when three out of the four quarters were bridged by the fracture callus. The biochemical monitoring was done uh, by the bone specific alkaline phosphatase uh, which uh, was based on ELISA immune assay in a micro titer strip format. The sampling was done at the day of trauma, four weeks and eight weeks, and they were stored at minus 40 degrees Celsius. The results, uh, we had 23 male patients and two female uh, patients at the mean age of 30 years. The mode of injury, 80% uh, of patients uh, had a high velocity injury, uh, maximum being the road traffic accident, and then fall from height. Uh, these are the changes in the bone specific alkaline levels with uh, fracture healing at four and eight weeks. We can see that there is a 40% rise at 4 weeks and 71% rise at 8 weeks, with a, which is significant at both 4 weeks and 8 weeks with a p-value less than 0 0.001. Here we show the similar changes in the bone specific alkaline phosphatase at 4 weeks and 8 weeks. Uh, this is a uh, radiograph of, of a case which shows that the level of bone specific alkaline phosphatase has risen from 11.8 to 28.3 and then 51.9 at 8 weeks. Similarly, in another case, there was the level has increased at four weeks and eight weeks. So we have correlated the level of the marker with uh, the clinical signs, such as fracture site mobility at four weeks. We can see that the, if the fracture was sticky in 21 cases, the level was significantly higher in cases in which the fracture was still, still displaceable with a significant p-value. Similarly, at eight weeks, in which the fracture site was not deformable in 22 cases, there was a significant rise of bone specific alkaline phosphatase compared to the three cases in which the fracture site was deformable. Now radiologically we could see that the callus appearing at eight weeks in the x-rays in the cases in which were 10 cases in which the callus was present at eight weeks there was a significant rise in bone specific alkaline phosphatase which was greater than the cases in which the, the callus was absent. Uh, this is the same uh, we can see the callus was abs uh, present there was a significant rise. So we conclude that there is a significant level uh, rise in the level of bone specific alkaline phosphatase which demonstrates a bone formation or osteoblastic activity. The rise parallel the clinical radiological signs such as absence of mobility and absence of uh, presence of fracture callus as well as it correlates with the presence of callus which indicates the role of bone specific alkaline phosphatase in mineralization of callus and consolidation of the fracture. So we can uh, conclude that the bone turnover markers can be uh, used as a non-invasive aids for assessing fracture healing which can complement the clinical radiological methods 
further research to throw more light on the complex process of bone formation and the intricate balance between bone formation and resorption can help us in finding new markers which can help us in early detection of non-union and delayed fractures at risk of non-union and delayed union. Thank you. Very good paper and uh, just a few questions. I think it's an excellent paper. But what were the investigations you would do before you decided to do the plaster cast? What all blood tests did you do? What all x-rays did you do? Can you just tell me? Because you have written so many exclusion criteria. That means you would have done MRI, PET scan, probably a lot of cancer markers to rule out all that. Is that so? We have taken, uh, we have done all the investigations which were possible in a government setup to exclude all the major causes of factors affecting bone turnover. So we have done, we have taken healthy young adult patients which, ha which have a stable range of bone specific alkaline phosphatase over 18 to 45 years. Then we have done the basic hemogram uh, with blood counts. Then we have excluded, uh, we have done blood sugar, renal function tests, liver function tests. And we have taken the history of the patient and examination of the patient to exclude all the things. Uh, and we have done calcium phosphorus levels also to exclude whatever we can exclude in our government setup. Okay. Okay. Sure. Yes. Sir, uh, we are still in a stage of research and our study has been a step towards it and we have studied the, and they have shown that there is a significant rise and we need to do further studies with including a lot of patients and taking fractures which are going into delayed union to see the significant changes. Sir, I just want to know, yes. Yes, sir, there have been uh, previous studies and our study, the uh, rise in the level of marker as well as the time of level of marker has been uh, similar to these studies. Yes. So do, you not, do you not think that a study which was covering all kinds of population but were checking marker levels in both, whether you had a medical problem or not having a medical problem affecting bone and would be actually more logical here? Because right now it's very difficult to put pinpoint that only this marker is what is being studied. I think. I, mean, I may be wrong, of course. Sir, uh, uh, we are at a starting of the research, so we have taken normal patients so that we can first state the baseline to see whether the marker, then we can extrapolate and... S right. Sir, uh, the, the, Eli the ELISA uh, kit for the bone-specific alkaline phosphate uh, costs around 40,000 rupees, sir, uh, which is for 96 patients sir 96 samples sir sir the uh, the samples were stored at minus 40 degrees celsius in the deep free refrigerator in the department of biochemistry sir thank you thank you uh, our next speaker is uh, dr bikrant manas uh, he'll be talking on a randomized control trial comparing outcomes of proximal femoral nail and reverse distal femoral locking compression plate in management of intertrochanteric fractures with compromised lateral wall. Good afternoon, respected chairpersons, judges, my seniors and my colleagues. Myself, Dr. Vikrant, presenting our study, a randomized control trial comparing PFN and reverse distal femoral locking compression plate in the management of intertrochanteric fractures with compromised lateral wall. Intertrochanteric fractures are one of the most common fractures in the elderly age group. They are associated with increased morbidity and mortality in this age. Post-operative union is usually not a problem. The most of patients are unable to achieve the functional outcome, which is pre-injury. Intertrochanteric fractures has been classified many classification systems. They have tried to divide the fractures into two groups, either stable or unstable group, in order to help in treatment and predict the prognosis in these patients. Classically, instability has been described as large posterior middle fragment, reverse oblique fractures, and fractures with significant subtrochanteric extension. The recent decade had drawn our attention toward one more important predictor, that is lateral wall. It is anatomically defined as lateral femoral cortex distal to the vastus ridge. It is the region we have observed, the region through which the leg screw and the reamer of DHS is placed into femoral head and neck region. Lateral wall, on the day-to-day -day basis, either we encounter a patient with broken lateral wall or we encounter a patient with weak lateral wall due to combination. 
So if we do DHS in this patient, there is break in the lateral wall, middleization of distal fragment, uncontrolled collapse of the fracture site, and these fixations are associated with poor outcomes and increase the chances of screw cutout. Palm et al., on the basis of lateral wall, propose a classification system and try to divide this system into two groups. Stable group and unstable group. All A1 and A2.1 were considered as stable group, and all A3 and A2.2 and 2.3 .3 as unstable group. He proposed not to use DHS in these patients. So if we have understood and if cleared with the importance of lateral wall in the management, so either we can use an implant, which is intramedullary, so we can, we can bypass the lateral wall, like PFN, or we can use extramedullary in order to reconstruct the lateral wall. Either we can use an implant, there are many implants which I have discussed in the literature, like DHS with trochanic stabilization plate, Madoff plate, proximal femoral locking oppression plate, but in our study we have used a distal femoral locking oppression plate. DFLP can be used in reverse because the contour of the greater condyle, lateral condyle of distal femur is very similar to the contour of the greater canter of the femur. And contralateral so that the anterior bow of the plate can negotiate the anterolateral curve of the proximal femur. There has been short communication in 2010 predict showing the use of DFLP in these fractures. And the recent years, there has been a randomized control trial comparing both the groups which we have used in our patients. Aim of our, fun aim of our study was to evaluate the outcomes of intertocantive fractures managed with either a PFN or DFLP. 40 patients, 20 in each group, in the Department of Orthopedics from November 11 to, to March 2013 were included in our study. And as a randomization table was obtained from computer-generated randomization.com, and our study is in process with registration for CTRI. All adult patients, patients with unstable fractures and operated within three weeks were included, and the rest of the patients were excluded. Coming to our results, intraoperative variables, we found duration of surgery, blood loss, fluoroscopy time to be higher in DFLP comparing to PFN, all, all are statistically significant. Other features, other variables like type of reduction, difficulty in reduction, surgeon perception of surgery, we did not find any significant difference, although surgeon found DFLP being more technically demanding and difficult surgery to do than PFN. Functional outcome was assessed at six months between both the groups, although Palmer-Parker mobility score did not provide us with any significant difference, but on using more sensitive and validated score, like Harris Swift score, we found functional outcome to be better in PFN than DFLP, and it was also confirmed by SF12, quality of life index in both physical and mental score were higher in PFN. In the nutshell, after 20 patients, 17 were available at final follow-up at six months, all had logical union. There was one revision surgery for implant failure due to technical regions, and there were two loss to follow-up. In DFLP group, out of 20 patients, 14 were available at final follow-up. There was 11 logical union, one non-union, two non-union, one malunion, and three revision surgeries for implant failure, and three were lost to follow-up. In this group, there was a total of six implant failures. We tried to evaluate the cause of implant failure in this group. So unlike literature, where they have described proximal screw cutout, screw baggage, or plate baggage being the most common patterns of implant failure, we found proximal screw loosening due to the failure of locking mechanisms of the plate being the most common cause. As we can see, out of six patients, five patients were in this group, and there was one failure due to technical reasons. There are some of the example, 27-year-old male with reverse oblique fracture, fixed by PFN, good union at six months with good functional outcome. There is a 43-year-old male with unstable fracture, fixed with DFLP, good union at six months with good functional outcome. This was 48-year-old male with unstable transverse fracture of proximal femur, fixed with DFLP. On subsequent x-rays, we found there was various collapse of the fracture site due to implant failure, but the patient denied surgery. So we continued following the patient, and fracture managed to unite at six months with, in 100 degree of coxavera. This is one of the failure of DFLP. Unstable fracture fixed with DFLP at nine weeks, we found there was failure and patient was revised. On based on our observations, DFLP is associated with high duration of surgery, high blood loss, and high fluoroscopy time. DFLP is also more technically demanding and difficult surgery than PFN. DFLP is also associated with poor functional outcome, less rate of logical union, and higher loss of reduction. So we conclude PFN being a better implant than reverse DFLP in endotrochanty fractures with compromised lateral wall, and the use of reverse DLP should not be encouraged in this group of fractures. There are some of the limitations. Thank you very much, and happy new year in anticipation. Thank you, uh, doc Dr. Vikrant. Yeah, sometimes it is necessary to conduct a study to conclude the obvious.
you've done, it's worth conducting this study. Yes, Dr. Yeah. So it's a, again a very good study. Just a, a quick question. You, have you tried doing this by a slight technique or a biological technique? Because ultimately everything depends on good reduction yes, sir. and maintaining that reduction. Yes. I think that's the same for all fractures. So have you also thought about trying doing it by slight technique? Because that would be a good comparison actually. Open reduction one side, closed reduction one side, not a very good study if you ask me. Yes, sir. So we have uh, included both the, both the groups and we have done either a closed, mini open or open. And we have documented in our study. There is a slide in which we have documented the types of slide which we have uh, described the uh, open, mini open and open in both the groups. We try to make, uh, do a closed reduction and then we try to make it closed. But if the reduction was not accept acceptable, then we open the fracture and then we do the open. Yes, sir. Uh, you put my observation into a question. <laughs> yes, sir. I will describe, sir. Sir, uh, we are already uh, preoccupied with the use of DHS in these patients. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, it's a recent concept. There has been, we, uh, it's a recent concept. In 2010, there were small communications, and there were some of the papers showing the use of DFLP with some indications in it. But over the year, in the last year, we found there was randomized control trial in the, both the groups comparing PFN and DFLP. There has been a biomechanical studies showing that DFLP being a equally stiff and stable implant with like DCS and PFN. There has been a clinical studies showing both the implants with near equal functional outcome in both the groups. That's why we conducted our studies. I think uh, there, were, there are some proponents of the two methods, so he wanted to compare them. And that's yes. a justification enough. Yes, thank you. Next speaker, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, next speaker is Dr. Mohammad Najim. He will be talking on fibula bone grafting in infected gap non-union, a prospective case series. Good morning, everybody. Today I am presenting the fibula bone grafting in infected gap non-union. Study conducted at MKCG Medical College, Barampur, Odisha. Infected gap union may be result of osteomyelitis with pathological fracture or compound fractures with bone loss. There is always a challenge for the surgeon, especially when the gap is more than 4 centimeters. Compound fracture type 3B with bone loss is the common cause of that entity and long-standing osteomyelitis, especially in children, may lead to formation of sequestrum of the shaft of variable length and we will left with instability and a big void after debridement. So the grade 3B compound fracture with bone loss or a extensive osteomyelitis of the proximal end of the humerus. So the problems with us is the infection, non-union with sclerotic and round ends, and the bone loss, that is the gap. Options at our hands, Elizero or LRS can be used, which are time consuming, need an expert. Patient has to tolerate with the heavy rings and it's not without complications. The use of fibula stud graft after control of infection was known since ages. Their success depends upon the ability of the surrounding tissue to withstand the operative manipulations and to revascularize the transported bone graft. And it was already known by that fibula is wonder bone. But no validation and a clear-cut guideline 
for the procedure that proper indication and timing of bone grafting and there is mixed results of non-vascularized fibula grafting in these situations. So our study, a prospective study of the infected gap non-union managed by staged procedure of debridement and fibula grafting. Materials and methods, 11 patients were included of which compound fracture with bone loss was 7 and chronic osteomyelitis with pathological fractures was 7 and an average gap was 5 centimeters. So in method, in stage 1, a thorough debridement and external fixator under antibiotic cover depending upon culture and sensitivity, intravenous antibiotic and open dressing for average of 2 weeks or till infection is controlled and healthy granulation is evident. So here is a case of infected non-union with implant loosening which was after debridement and implant removal and an external fixator was used. That was the stage 1 procedure. In stage 2, the fibula stud graft is placed to bridge the gap and fixed with cortical screws or K wires. External fixator is retained which gives stability to the construct. Wound closed primarily or skin grafting or flaps was used. Oral antibiotics were continued. And this was the x-ray of the same patient after fibula bone grafting fixed with cortical screw and the fixator was retained. In stage 3, the fixator was removed and cast immobilization for 2 weeks. The cast was removed and partial weight bearing with crutches for lower limb cases and guarded exercise for 4 weeks was performed. In follow-up, patients were followed every month for a year with an average follow-up of 14 months. The assessments of outcome were at 6 months and at 1 year in terms of union and incorporation of the fibula determined clinically and radiographically, functional recovery compared with other limb and the evidence of infection or other complications. So the first case a grade 3B compound fracture of tibia in a 12 year old boy with a 6, average, six centimeter of bone loss which was managed with the free non-vascularized fibula graft taken from the ipsilateral side and the radiographic radiographs after 6 months showing complete healing at both the ends of the fibula graft and hypertrophy and tibialization of the fibula graft was evident on radiograph taken after four years. And another case of chronic osteomyelitis of the distal end of the femur, which was after debridement and external fixator was given. And after control of the infection and granulation tissue, the fibula graft was given. And this is the clinical photo of the patient at six months of follow-up, which she is bearing partial weight on the affected limb. And another case of osteomyelitis of the proximal humerus, which, have, which we have seen initially, we have done a thorough debridement and an external fixator was given, which was later stabilized by a fibula graft and an intramedullary K wire was given and the wound was closed primarily. So the results, 11 patients with average follow-up of 14 months, the radiological union achieved in 90% of the patient at an average of 5.1 months with incorporation of the fibula graft. 80% of the patients have good functional recovery and satisfied with the treatment. Complication that is shortening due to destruction of the growth plate by the disease process or morbidity at the donor site, which was minimal. Persistence of infection in two cases with discharging sinus managed with debridement and local antibiotic beads with cement. The infected gap non-union and osteomyelitis with pathological fracture is always challenging. Variety of options are available, each with its own limitations and complications. Fibula grafting, both free and vascularized, have been used in various studies with diverse results. The advantages of using fibula, fibula is the strongest cortical autogenous bone graft available. 
and large quantity, the entire proximal two-third of the fibula can be used. The configuration of the proximal end of the fibula is also have some advantage. Our experience with Papineau technique, which emphasize on the formation of healthy granulation tissue in a bed of the bone graft that will become rapidly vascularized. And as we know, that the granulation tissue is resistant for infection. So in conclusion, our study is the simplification of complex problem and a protocol for management, which is time saving, require less expertise, easily reproducible, cost effective, especially in our Indian scenario. Thank you. Paper is open for discussion. Any questions? Yeah, I have mentioned. After debridement, we have to go regular dressing. We have to look for reduce of discharge and appearance of healthy granulation tissue. Because the compound wood is open, so health, appearance of healthy granulation tissue is the criteria. Sir, we have taken first culture when the when we are including that including that patient and another culture at the, at the time of debridement if it is same we have to continue with that antibiotic either we have to change because the superficial culture sometimes will differ from the deep cultures no no primary closure after the second stage if possible or it may be given with skin graft or flap procedure may be given if it is possible, we can close primarily after second stage. After second stage, I told you. That is fibula grafting. After fibula grafting, we have to close. Before fibula grafting, the wound is open. So we can judge the granulation tissue. Is it clear? Sir, that is true, sir. But we have used that cortical bone, no cancellous graft was used because maybe the healthy granulation tissue was on our side. I think uh, the session comes to a close. Thank you very much to all the presenters and the judges and the audience. And uh, now the next session of Joy Path. Who will be speaking on role of orthography of elbow in the management of lateral condyle fractures of humerus in children? Uh, good afternoon, uh, respected chairpersons, all seniors presenter, and my dear friends. Today I will be talking to you about the role of orthography in lateral condyle fractures, especially in children. Now, to give a gist of my talk, I will be talking about lateral condyle fractures and what is the main problem associated with them. And we will be emphasizing on the role of arthrography in the management of these fractures. And also, I will talk to you about the study and the results of the uh, done in our institution. Now, to int in the introduction, lateral condyle fractures, they are the second most common fractures after the supracondylar fracture in children. And historically, it has been seen that untreated or mistreated lateral condyle fractures, they have a poorer outcome and can give devastating complications compared to a supracondylar fracture. Now, what is the main problem associated with the lateral condyle? This is an X-ray of a radiograph of a skeletally immature child of the elbow and the articular region. This area shown in green, so much is the articular region which we don't see in an X-ray. So any injury to this area, we don't know. And the other thing is the ossification center. We know that the ossification of the lateral condyle occurs the last, and there are multiple ossification centers around the elbow. And in this latest article in the American Academy, they said that non-treated lateral condyle or mistreated lateral condyle fractures, they can give a non-union or malunion lean tucubitis valgus and even a tardy ulnar nerve palsy, and also an avascular necrosis. So in the classification, Milch was previously used, which is followed by Jacob's classification. And in Jacob, the most common thing, 
they say is according to the displacement of the lateral condyle. Type 1 is less than 2 millimeter, type 2 is up 2 to 4 and type 3 is more than 4 and even this rotational instability. So if we see in type 3 there is complete disruption of the cartilage but in type 1 and type 2 there is still evidence we have to find out whether there is the articular hinge is intact or non-intact which determines the treatment process. Now the treatment options for a type 1 mostly conservative treatment is advised and in, and in a type 2 closed reduction and fixation is advised but if you don't get it closed, you, you can even open it. In a type 3, open reduction and fixation, which is most commonly advised and there are a lot of literature to show that people treat type 3 only by open reduction and fixation. So in this x-ray, if we subject it to an MRI, what looks like an undisplaced fracture, if you see the fracture line goes into the articular cartilage and thereby, as this in the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma, they say even if it's an undisplaced fracture, if the cartilage hinge is broken or if it extends into the cartilage hinge, it is an unstable fracture. So how do we visualize the cartilaginous hinge? We have the MRI and the ultrasound, but they have their own pitfalls being expensive, dynamic study is not possible, and most important, we need to sedate the patient to treat this and find out about them. So that brings us to our question about contrast arthrography. As early as the 1980s, contrast arthrography came into being, and in this paper, in the Radiological Society of America, they said it's an inexpensive technique requires minimal technical expertise and a dynamic study is possible and the limits of open reduction are very much reduced. So then what is the dye used? We use an iohexol dye which is non-ionic and water soluble and after injection this is the picture we get in the in the x-ray. So in our institution all lateral condyles after immobilization under anesthesia they are assessed and then the visualization under the image intensifier. This is uh, a video to show about the uh, about the technique. Under the image intensifier, just above the radial head, the dye is injected and serial radiographs are taken and in this, if you see, there is extravasation of the dye through the radial head showing that the articular cartilage is not intact. And then the dynamic study in flexion and extension is done. And also, based upon the fracture morphology, the fixation and treatment is done. And this is most important. Even after fixation, the dynamic study is done. So, to find out the congruency of the cartilage and our elbow cast is given and a post-op x-ray is taken. Now what does arthrography really give us advantage? Degree of displacement, the articular cartilage and also the congruency after reduction which is not seen even in an MRI and is not possible also and also a dynamic study. So these are a few of our cases, a Jacob type 2 slightly displaced under arthrogram, the dynamic study was done, fixation was done and patient had a very good outcome. This is an interesting case, what looks on an x-ray as a Jacob type 1 undisplaced fracture as we subjected into the under the image intensifier and also under the arthrogram, we found it's a huge fragment which is extending into the joint and it's unstable. So what looked as a Jacob type 1 is actually not a Jacob type 1, it's a Jacob type 2. So this patient was fixed with K-wires and then dynamic stability was checked and after the articular congruence was achieved, the patient was treated with a cast and fixation. So majority of our cases were of type 3 which was the grossly displaced and articular hinge disrupted ones. And in a type 3, literature says open reduction is the best treatment. But what are the problems with open reduction? If you see elbow stiffness, osteonecrosis, malunion, and inevitably a post-op scar, and also a posterior dissection that disrupts the blood supply, giving necrosis to avascular necrosis, which is common. So in this paper by Dr. Song from Korea, they say open reduction is advised for type 3. But in our study, 9 patients out of the 15, which is a significant number, could be treat closed and the uh, extensive dissection was avoided. And out of the 28 patients, in 26 patients, the radiological grading matched the orthographic grading. But in two patients, as we saw, what was type 1 on an X-ray was type 2 on the orthogram and thereby the entire treatment plan changed. So the summary of our results, the two main important uses of orthography, it helps to differentiate between type 1 and type 2. And in type 3, after fixation, the articular cartilage can be assessed and it limits the open reduction. There were few cases of dry expectivation, but because the capsular tear was seen, but there were no specific complications. In the latest journal of pediatric orthopedics, they say that arthrography is a useful technique and an accurate test for studying the lateral condyle fractures. And if JBJS and the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma had said that it's of paramount importance to verify reduction, especially intraoperatively after the fixation has been done. So to conclude, if you weigh 
the advantages and the disadvantages of an arthrography of the lateral condyle. It gives you a better understanding of the fracture morphology because the ossification is not yet complete. It facilitates dynamic studies in flexion and in extension, and it reduces the need for open reduction. And it differentiates between type 1 and type 2, which is very important. And most of all, it is inexpensive and requires minimal technical expertise. And for the disadvantages, you can say because of the uh, image intensifier and the serial imaging, there is chances of radiation exposure. And also, due to the capsular tear, dye extravertation is seen in a few cases, but does not cause any specific complications. So weighing the advantages and disadvantages, the advantages far outweigh the disadvantages. And we say that arthrography is a very important and useful tool in the treatment of lateral condyle fractures in children. Thank you. Well, before I open the paper for discussion, may I ask a question? In how many patients, after doing the arthrography in your series, could you do a close reduction in KY fixation? Yes, that is all the type 2 fractures. The type 2 fractures, we had nine of them. All the nine of them were treated with a close reduction and a K-wire. In type 2 and in the type 3, 15 cases. Of the 15, nine were treated with close reduction. The, the point is that you have raised the issue that it is difficult yes. to find out the Jacob type 1 yes. on AP view. Yes, but there are oblique views, and if you have the experience of the oblique view, then they do show up the displacement in spite of the fact that it is cartilaginous and all that. Always a piece of bone comes out, and you can work it out. The thing is that it's in small children, sir, for the oblique views, it's the stress you have to give and that causes a lot of pain and it's very difficult to take that. So anyhow, these patients under image intensifier, they need to be taken, the anesthesia, sedation has to be given to take the oblique views. So we just say that once you diagnose it as a lateral condyle in the theatre under sedation, because you're going to anesthetize the patient, we can use arthrography, you can get, you can even study the exact morphology. Yeah, but oblique views are, have been advised to take it. But it's very difficult to children to take that views. Okay. Any other questions, please? Yes. But the only thing is that in uh, type 1 and type 2, it's very difficult to differentiate them, even in an oblique view. You just, it's very difficult because, in especially in the, below the age of 5 in the... Yes, please. Uh, in continuation of the same, one yeah. and one question. You said that oblique view causes pain. Yeah. But arthrography... Under anesthesia, we're doing it completely. Yeah, but, but with the help of this, we can also treat the complete fracture. We can even do the fixation. The dye Omnipack is actually 150 rupees and you get uh, 20 ml. Yeah, 20 ml. No, it was done in our institution that, uh, no, we, uh, we just say that, sir, for, insp you don't need to take the patient again. Yeah, we just want to show that arthrography, with arthrography, I'm saying that you don't need to do an MRI also, even the views directly. No, they say, no, Chinese patient has just said about the treatment modality. We are just saying about, we can even use with, as a Chinese patient in the, you can even use an internal oblique view. But what we say is, in an orthography, you can sum up everything. You can even study, and even after fixation, you can even study the The only thing is that it is an invasive procedure. Yes, yes. And an MRI is a non-invasive procedure. Yes. Any other questions? Yes, please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, ah, yes, sir. Actually, but in type 1, sometimes you see, as we saw two of our cases, on the x-ray it was a type 1. But then, using arthrogram, we found out it was a type 2 because of the articular cartilage is not seen. So, 
That is the one reason by orthography, you cannot miss even a type 2. A type 2 and a type 1 differentiation is quite difficult in a plain radiograph. Actually, there was a paper in the JBJS where they had a 40-year-old follow-up of a, a non-union of the lateral condyle. In that, actually, they were saying that it is very common. Up to 17% is missed. The type 1 and type 2, they get missed. For a type 1, you think it's a type 1 and treatment is done. And later, it's found out that it's actually a type 2. Even by uh, senior surgeons, that was a paper in the JBJS. So that is what our main thing is, our role in arthrography in helping in diagnosing and treating these fractures. We just study these fractures, you get a be better morphological study of the fracture. Though we can even treat it by an MRI, but we can take get a good study. Yes. Get an X ray after Yes. Uh, in type three you have said that in nine cases you have were able to do the close reduction. Yes, yes, sir. But in type three the rotation is in two directions, vertical yes. and horizontal direction. Yes. Sir. Were you able to reduce them yes, closely? Yes, that's what even the because dynamic... there are the two forces. That's what the dynamic stabilities are. After fixation, also we could check. In a, as we had shown in a hand hand table. Yeah, with the joysticking. Burkhidin is joysticking also is done. Yes. Next to speak up. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And the next topic... Trivial hemimalia and complex presentation, a case series. Dr. Nanda Kumar Natracham. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Thank you to everyone for giving me the opportunity to present this case. I am here to present a case series of complex congenital anomalies of lower extremities from our institute, Madras Medical College. So coming to the introduction, it's limb deficiency disorder is not rare nowadays. We can see in our OP and daily OP also. It is associated with the heter heterogenic skeletal dysplasia and occur as isolated anomaly or as a complex. Limb deficiency literally means either it can be absence or reduction in the size. And the other anomaly is either it can be ectrodactyly, lobster gland, or tibial amemalia with split hand and foot malformation. So we started our... Uh, study in, uh, in our institute in child health in Egmore from the period January 2011 to December 2013 and it's a short term analysis. Our longest follow up is two years. A total of 10 patients have been selected. We initially classified into two groups, either it is isolated tibial amemalia or complex anomalies. All the cases have been, we used a classification of Weber classification. Most of our groups fall in the group of type 7 and uh, one patient is in the type 3. So the major Weber classification, we majorly make an important note in the cartilage and latch, whether it is present or absent. If it is absent, we proceed all the cases with knee disarticulation. And if it is present, we classify and we stage, we, we differentiate the procedure either into the brown procedure or knee disarticulation. So in our study of isolated tibial amemalia, six patients, three we proceeded, three, three, three fall in the group of type 7B, so we did knee disarticulation. Only two we can do, the one of the patient it's not accepting for the surgery. And with cartilage and large present, type 3 we did a brown procedure and also the ankle arthrodesis. In type 7A, one of the patients we did for brown procedure. So this is a case example. Here case 1, complete absence of tibia. 7B, this is false in the 7B. We did a knee disarticulation and early prosthetic rehabilitation and good functional score as obtained for, the, for this patient. We had a OSOT score of uh, mild uh, disability. So this has been substantiated by the literature of journal and bo bone and joint surgery. Earlier surgical intervention and prosthetic application gives better results, functional results. And this is a case of type 3B. You can proximally in the x-ray itself, you can see a tibia has been present. And in the MRI also, we can see the analog. So as a stage 1 procedure, we did with the fibula osteotomy, bring down the fibula at the level of the tibia, and do a synostosis between tibia and fibula by applying cancellous screw fixation. 
Then later in the stage two, we also osteotomize the lower end of the fibula and bring back into the neutral portion over the talus and the arthrodesis of the ankle has been done. So it takes multiple procedures and finally when you see at the follow up of two years, there is an obvious shortening of 15 centimeter and fixed flexion deformity of 15 degree is also present. And the quadriceps power is three. So we applied another, we applied, a, we amplified the patient with prosthetic application. So this has been clearly a surgical type of treatment has been available in the literature and it has been explained. So now we move on to associated involvement. 75% of the patient with tibial amemelia, if you carefully see, there are other anomalies of skeletal defects has been present, like lobster fruit and polydactyly, club foot, or bifurcated femur. So all these, uh, when these anomalies are present, uh, complex, then we term it as gallop vulcan complex. We had a four patients, one is unilateral, the three patients are bilateral. All the bilateral group fall in the newborn group in which one expired in the neonatal period due to respiratory complication. The unilateral group of patients falls one. We did a medial reaction followed by knee disarticulation we did. So this is a case, bilateral tibial amemelia with a medial femoral bifurcation we did. And now we come to a dilemma when to do a knee disarticulation. Most of the literature I have not given a specific time when to do. So this is a, another new case I have already told, it's a died in the newborn period. And this is a case 8. This is very rare presentation. You can see a complete uh, tibial amemelia absence in the left side and complete age genesis of both tibia and fibula and ankle diastasis on the right side. Uh, this has been previously reported only once in uh, literature. A case of uh, femoral bifurcation with a diastasis and the ankle has been reported only once. That's the importance why we have posted this case. And uh, every article shows sooner the augmentation, but they have not clearly mentioned when to do. So we formed a protocol uh, by investigating the patients with the MRI, and you follow the web score, whether the cartilage analogy is present or not, and the quadriceps power, and associated with the other anomalies, we give importance to the cocks of femora and also the club foot. So any score more than 11, we plan for brown procedure, only in type 3. If, uh, if it, even in type 3, if the quadriceps power is less, then we go for knee disarticulation. So our management, we fixed a protocol. We, we allow the child, uh, we wait for the patient till the age, till, till the child crawls. So we we fixed in the group in the time time period for operate for knee disarticulation one to two years. So in our group, uh, total of 13 affected limbs of the 10 out of the 10 patients, uh, all are male patients. Left is more commonly affected. Bilateral is three. Uh, type 7, 92 percent of our cases. Type 3 is only one case. It's eight percent. Uh, we did totally knee disarticulation of three patients, and the OSWT score was uh, good. It's a uh, mild disability, 20. And in the those who did brown procedure two, we did the disability score is moderate. Medial reaction was done in two. They are waiting for uh, knee disarticulation. So coming to the discussion, the functional outcome score for the knee disarticulation no series were comparable with other studies like Tarak et al. So by coming to the conclusion. Uh, now you look at the picture of the newborn. If we had, a, we had a baby or child with us like this means, by simply saying we have to go for knee disarticulation at the first first visiting itself, definitely the parents will not accept and we ourselves will not accept for knee disarticulation. But the end result for knee disarticulation for the functional score is very good. Most of the parents who thought by doing the knee disarticulation we are making the patient more disabled and more uh, socially they are uh, segregated. So. We need a proper pre-op counseling with the peer group, both with the patients, that the peer group should include both the knee disarticulation and both patients, those who had a multiple staged procedure like brown procedure, finally they land up in knee shortening and even they also have to have a prosthetic application. So the pre-op counseling is the first thing uh, to look at the functional outcome and uh, most of the time we should uh, initiate for knee disarticulation. Thank you. Thank you for a very nice paper. Uh, the paper is open for discussion. Yes, please. Yes, please do.
Yes, please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. They have searched by the literature. Yes, sir. Yes. No, sir. Sir, uh, I'm not telling it's common, sir. It's not rare, sir. And most of the patients, those of the with the skeletal defects, usually in, in the rural group, they have a pre-thought mind that whatever may be the treatment, we are not going to improve the patients in walking. That we have to break it. So by proper pre op counseling, even we ourselves, uh, we might not thought by needless articulation, prosthetic application, the patient will be walking, we might not know. So that's the reason the patient inflow to the OP itself is less. I totally agree. It's very difficult to convince the parent. They run away and they do not come back. Yes. And then you see grown-ups begging or doing some odd job. And uh, really, if you if you do knee disarticulation at the young age, then the children, they adapt extremely well to the prosthesis. And from that point of view, your paper gives a lot of message. Thank you, sir. Right. Thank you very much. And the next presentation is on is prone position ideal for manipulation and pinning of displaced pediatric supracondylar fractures of humerus, a randomized controlled trial. Dr. Gauri Shankar Saravanamurthy. Yes, please. Uh, good afternoon to one and all. Today my topic is is prone position ideal for manipulation and pinning of pediatric supracondylar humerus fractures, a randomized controlled trial. Coming to the introduction, supracondylar humerus fracture is one of the most common fractures around the elbow, which constitute about 60% of all upper limb fractures in children. In search of literature, there are various papers which quotes about the methods of fixation, the stability of pin constructs, the role of open reduction, and management of associated vascular injury and complications of the fracture. All these papers state that the fracture has been manipulated in supine position. But in the recent past, there are various papers, for example, from Fowler et al. and Avalos et al., who states that prone position manipulation seems to be advantageous. <clears throat> the advantages which has been quoted by these authors are, the CM movement is easier in prone position, the median and the lateral condyles are felt better, and there is a gravity-assisted reduction in reducing these fractures. But the difficulties encountered during this prone position are, the manipulation is difficult because there is inability to lock the fragments and causes instability of the fragments at the time of fixation. In supine position, if we go through, the supine position is widely and easier done procedure, but the difficulties faced in supine position are, it is difficult to interpret the AP view if there is no clear view of the CR. Though manipulation in prone position is claimed to be advantageous by these authors, there is no evidence in the literature comparing the most widely performed supine position to the prone position manipulation. So against this background, we embarked a comparative study between supine versus prone position in our institute. The aims of the study is to study the efficacy of the pinning in supine versus prone position in terms of the duration of procedure, the number of radiation exposures, the number of attempts at reduction, and number of attempts to place the pins, and to compare the adequacy of reduction on the post-operative x-rays and to assess the functional outcomes. The materials and methods, the study period was conducted in our hospital between April 2010 to April 2011, and group allocation was through a computerized block randomization technique. Ethical committee approval was taken, and informed consent was also taken in all the patients. The clinical assessment was assessed using Flint's criteria and radiological assessment by Bowman's angle. And statistical significance was by student t-test where the p-value significant value was less than 0.05. The inclusion criteria in our patients were age group of 3 to 14 years were included in the study and uh, fractures with less than one week old and gartlands exclusively type 3 fractures were included in the study. The exclusion criteria were closed phrases, open fractures, other ipsilateral upper limb fractures and disvascular limb were excluded. Um, <coughs> there were a total of 52 patients enrolled in our study with 26 constituting both the supine and the prone group. The mean age of presentation of all these pediatric fractures were about 7.2. Technique for supine position pinning was the, by traction and counteraction. The first the coronal angulation was corrected, and the digital fragment was reduced. And locking the fragment, the pins were placed. Prone position was done under regional anesthesia. The patient was placed in the prone with arm by the side of an arm board, and the elbow was supported with the help of a cushion. 
and the gravity assisted reduction helped in reducing these fractures and the pins were placed. The standard lateral divergent pins were placed and the rotational stability was checked. If it was found to be unstable, a medial pin was introduced for these fractures. And the patient was, and the surgery was done by a single surgeon to avoid the bias. During the intraoperatively, the parameters which were noted were the duration of procedure. It is the interval from positioning the patient to casting the limb after insertion of pins. The number of radiation exposures is from the beginning to manipulation till the end of pinning. The number of attempts of closed reduction is defined as the sum of all unsuccessful reductions till the last successful reduction just before pinning. And the number of attempts for pinning was the trials to transfix each fragment with good purchase in both cortices with two or three pins. The post-operative regimen fall followed at regular intervals at the end of one week, one month, six months, and one year. The patient was on a POP slab for the first one week. At the end of one week, the POP slab was changed into a POP cast for the next three weeks. At the end of four weeks, the cast was removed and the pins were removed and elbow mobilization was started. The clinical assessment was done based on the Flynn criteria while the radiological assessment with the help of Bowman's angle. The Flynn's criteria takes into two account. One is the cosmetic factor, the other one is the functional factor. And uh, according to Ely, the number of patients which was enrolled in our study was 52. But in the prone position, the, it was equally divided as 26 and 26. According to the randomized uh, allocation method, two patients in the prone group, we were found it difficult to reduce the fracture. Hence, they were repositioned to supine group and they were excluded from the study. In the supine group, we had a satisfactory outcome of about 91.3%. And in the prone group, we had a satisfactory outcome of about 87%. During this prospective study, we lost four patients in the follow-up, three in supine group and one in prone group. And the parameters which were entered during the procedure, they were compared between the supine and prone group, and we found no statistical significance in terms of the duration of procedure, number of radiation exposure, closed attempts, and attempts at pinning. The radiological assessment was done using Bowman's angle, which gives us a mean value of about 16.4, and we had a satisfactory uh, outcome in both supine and prone group with no statistical significance. But we had two complications in the prone group who developed cubitus virus deformity. Just coming to the final outline, total of 52 patients with 26 in supine and prone group, we had two patients who developed cubitus virus deformity in prone group, and one patient developed a compartment syndrome, which I'll be telling it, and two patients who had uh, difficulty in reducing the patient in prone position, but changed it to supine position, and they were excluded from the study. So, comparing our supine group with the uh, earlier literatures, we had a satisfactory of outcome of 91.3, which was well comparable with all the other studies. We didn't have any cubitus virus deformities in our follow-up in supine groups, and all the patients were doing well at the end of one year. But prone group, we had a satisfactory results of only 87%, with complications of two patients with cubitus virus and one patient with compartment syndrome. The two patients which were excluded from the prone group were the patient had a skin puckering due to buttonholing of the brachialis muscle and the fracture was irreducible in prone. So they were repositioned to supine and they were reduced. They were excluded from the study. This is our case one where a six-year-old boy with a right elbow with skin puckering which according to the randomized controlled uh, uh, technique was in prone position group but he was irreducible. So it was changed to supine position and he was pinned. This is the follow-up at the end of one year. This is a 10-year-old boy who was manipulated in prone position and this is the result at the end of one year. And this is a nine-year-old boy who was manipulated in prone position, but post-operatively he developed a compartment syndrome where a fasciotomy was done for this patient. And later on, flap and skin coverage was done. This is the end of one year, his result. He had a FFT of about 60 degrees with reasonably well-functional outcome of his left upper limb. So to conclude, Prone position has its advantages as claimed by the authors, but when compared to supine position, we did not find any statistically significant uh, changes in both the supine and the prone group. However, in our group, we had complications namely cubitus virus and compartment syndrome in the prone group. And it cannot be used in complex patterns and skin puckering patients as we had problems in two patients. So to conclude that supine position, pinning is recommended as it is safer, reproducible and easier to perform. Thank you. The paper is open for Discussion. Yes, please. Yes, sir. We had a, a research analyst, and he said that the cases to be around more than 50. So we got a value of about 52 cases. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Even for the supine group, we give reason and anesthesia. No general anesthesia. Suppose if the patient is a little bit uncomfortable, we sedate the patient. Two patients. Two 
So among the uh, cosmetic factor analysis by Flynn's criteria, sir, we had two patients who had uh, 10 degrees of FFD where the carrying angle could not be measured. So we were not able to measure the exact carrying angle in these patients. Yes, sir. In this patient, the cosmetic factor measures only the carrying angle, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Patients, at the time of prone position, if we had discomfort, they had to sedate the patient, but we didn't take into account the number of patients we sedated during the procedure. That was all. The other thing is that we had been reducing supracondylar fractures in supine position for generations. How many people are here who reduce their supracondylars in prone position, apart from you, of course? None. So really, there is an easy way to do a thing, and there is a difficult way to do a thing. So why make your life and the patient's life more difficult? Thank you very much. And the last paper of this session is a new technique.